I've been thinking a lot about the lack of talent in the STEM field and particularly women uh, in the STEM field. And um, it made me think about an article I came across a few years ago by Robert Livingston in Harvard Business Review. And in his article, he talked about a case study with Harvey Mudd College and how they had had really amazing results getting more women to come into computer science and stay in computer science. And now that I have a senior in high school who's going into college and selecting computer science, um, I have seen these challenges firsthand. And so I've been meaning to research this for some time, and I came across a video of Maria Claw, who is the president of Harvey Mudd College. And Harvey Mudd College is a small private institution focused on STEM. This video is actually about 10 years old, and um, but I think there's still some amazing tidbits in here worth sharing. And I'm sure there's probably been more progress since then, but um, I think that corporate America can actually learn a few things from some of the things they did here at Har Harvey Mudd. One of the things that was really impressive was not just their ability to get more women into computer science, but also to get more um, faculty, female faculty. In fact, in 1997, they only had about 20%. And she was saying that um, by 2011, they were over 40% female. But schools like MIT, Princeton, Stanford were all in the teens as far as female faculty. Now, I'm sure these numbers have changed since then, but uh, still really impressive um, progress. And some of the things she talked about as far as their change um, to attract more female students really um, struck me as fairly simple, but probably took some time to dissect and get to the root cause of why this is happening. So I thought I'd share some of the things I thought were really interesting. First of all, she talks about how imposter syndrome um, was overrepresented in underrepresented categories. So she gave an example of a female taking her first computer science class and maybe getting a B plus for the first time and then thinking, oh, I don't belong here, versus the boys who are making C's and just pushing right through. We know this to be true with um, applying for jobs as well. A guy will apply for a job if they only have 80% of the skills, whereas a woman will feel like they need to have 100%. So one of the things they did at a huge uh, female tech conference was to host an imposter panel with highly successful female executives in the tech industry and have them talk about how they've had times where they feel like an imposter as well. She also talked about non-inclusive behavior. So um, with these um, students who are coming in and have had years of self-taught um, skills in technology, and they're, they're pumped up, right? They're, my daughter calls them geeks, right? <laughs> um, people who are so excited about this field of computer science. And they're just going crazy and talking about it, and they're so passionate. But what that tends to do is makes it very intimidating for those who perhaps are not at that skill level. So one of the things they taught the faculty to do was to basically pull those students aside and say, hey, look, we love having you in this class. We love your passionate. But just so you know, when you talk about this, that or another, um, it's very intimidating for the other students. And um, many of them were just like, oh, I was not aware of that. In fact, I thought it was really cute. She talked about how when she gives this talk, talk to other institutions, there's always um, quite a few of the professors who are in the audience who come up and say, oh my gosh, I was that person. And so with that passion and um, excitement, it creates uh, an intimidating environment or non-inclusive environment. And I can tell you firsthand from my daughter, who in her junior year took her very first AP computer science class. And she had many boys in that class who had been 
uh, self-taught, who had been coding for years, who had been going to coding camps, who were competing in global hackathons. And she's a pretty confident young woman, and I'm so glad that she used her influence skills to get help from the boys versus uh, completely dropping that class. And um, it all makes sense now, right, why she found that class to be so challenging. Which brings me to this third point of naturally interested versus nurtured interest. So they talked about some of these students um, and how systemically our education system, especially in elementary and middle school, um, there's really a lack of computer science teachers. And as a result, there's not that foundation built right into the, the school systems. And um, the kids who come in with all the skill, it's because they have a natural passion for it and are, for the most part, self-taught. Now, what they found is that this interest can be nurtured. And that brings me to this fourth, fourth point, where what they did um, was they had an entry-level computer science class that was required. Now, keep in mind, this is a STEM school, and that the students were all required to take a computer science course. Initially, they had a required Java course, and I don't know anything about programming, but apparently, uh, according to Maria and to my and my daughter, Java um, is not nearly as intuitive as Python. And so they redesigned that first year course um, to from a Java course to computational problem solving in Python. So one of the things they also did was take the students, and they talk about this here in the article, and they basically had two introductory computer science tracks, and one was for people with no computing experience and others with some. And um, as it turns out, the course with uh, no prior experience tended to be about 50% women. And apparently by the end of the semester, all the students were on par with each other. The other thing they did was, um, because this turned out to be, it went from um, the most despised course to the most loved course, and they made it so much fun. Um, you know, things like making sure they felt like they had choices in their assignments, right, and that there was purpose in why they were learning this. But many of the non-computer science majors actually went on to take two or three computer science courses from there. By the time they get to their third course, some of them, this nurture part, would be like, you know what, this is not too bad. And the other thing they did was make sure that they're promoting the profession, right? So there's a lot of talk around STEM, and she talked about how we actually don't need any more biology majors or chemistry majors. And she says most of them think they're going to go on, you know, to medical school. But the reality is um, the world does not need any more biology or chemistry majors. They actually need more computer science majors. And they talk about how they promote, you know, what a great living it is, what um, the difference they can make in, in the world, as well as um, just the flexibility that comes with the profession. I can tell you that from a talent management perspective, there's a lot of discussion as to why there's such a fall off of diverse talent up in the leadership ranks. And perhaps there's some lessons that we can learn from what Harvey Mudd College has done here. One of the questions that came out of Q&A uh, was talking about recruiting of underrepresented um, students. And one of the things that they did was the faculty would actually reach out by phone to the students who were non-white or Asian to invite them to join their institution. And apparently it more than doubled the number of students who accepted. Imagine if you're able to, to have the actual hiring leader of that um, that division or function, the VPs, maybe even the CEO, right, making a call to candidates um, who you really want to close and what an impact that would make on your close rates. I'd love to hear from you if in your organization 
you have figured out some systemic issues that are keeping your underrepresented talent from getting promoted and what steps you've taken in order to um, accelerate the progress. Oh, one last thing I wanted to mention when we were talking about this non-inclusive behavior. One of the things that really turned my daughter around and got her to go from, I don't think I'm good at computer science and I'm not sure that I'm gonna cut it in this field was actually going to a camp called Coding with Clossy. And Clossy apparently was a supermodel who decided to start a coding camp just for girls. And it was such an amazing experience and it gave her the confidence to say, yes, this is where I plan to um, focus my energy. In addition, she had an opportunity to interview quite a few CIOs, female CIOs, who didn't actually start off in coding. And I think that made a big difference in her um, ability, her ability to see um, what's possible. So one of the things I'd love for HR leaders to consider is putting more personal branding around the underrepresented employees that you have to help the company with employment brand, but also to let others who are in that underrepresented category um, see that there's opportunities, there's people like them. I can tell you going down the entrepreneurial path was not at all encouraged in my household. You know, actually in the Asian household, doing something in STEM is uh, almost mandatory. Um, but because I had role models who were female, young females who ran businesses successfully, um, it uh, really gave me the courage to do that when I was 24 years old. I think there's a saying that says you can't be what you can't see. And uh, I truly believe that is the case. All right, drop your comments below if you have any thoughts on uh, the challenges that you see, the systemic issues um, within organizations and or your success stories that you might have um, in your organizations.